Jim. Oh, and Tony, are you right being poor? No, that's fine. <laughs> Jim. Back to parking. One of the, one of the things I don't understand is how you maintain security for residents versus an open lot for cathedral. Excellent question. Who wants to address that? And, and maybe John can support that too. So this is going to be largely underground with controlled access. Uh, the residential parking will be all on the first level, and to get in, at least the last drawings I saw, you have to go through a gate that raises and, and lowers. Okay. Uh, the, the, the stuff on, on the bottom level uh, will be access. You, you get a, the access, but it's, it's not going to be a wide open parking uh, lot. In fact, I would suggest to you that the security in this new parking lot will be far above and beyond what's there now. And, and part of that is because of occupancy. Right now that building is vacant for a, a big chunk of the of the week and uh, people can come and go and there's nobody there, there are no eyes on that property uh, it, with a with a residential space there are going to be people coming in and out all the time and and there's going to be a lot of eyes uh, on what's there and i, I you know would imagine that that's going to create a whole lot more security for folks a little bit more on that then in terms of the control and access for members of this faith community so two two aspects of it first off there will be controlled access because we want to be able to sell we will be able to rent it out when we can to have another income stream in addition to the, the third, third, third type of thing. So we recognize there's a, a, a discounted market for that just because we need it when we need it. But there's available demand for it during the week that we want to sell. So we have to have controlled access there. The question is that, well, how do you then do the controlled access for members here on Sunday morning? We're going to work through that. If there, there's people who solve these parking problems before, I know when the downtown church is, makes a lot of money after park and, and works this through, so there's other models to do this, and we just got we got to get to that level of detail. The other part is, is we know at 325 there's been a problem with it it's serving as a haven for the homeless, and I would hate to have a parking ramp for parking to arrive and come back. We would share that concern, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> we uh, can solve that. Second question was Michael. What's the construction timeline? We are hoping that we will be in the ground somewhere between the end of April and be by the middle of June. So that's what we're targeting. Um, and then it will be one year of construction. So the fixed line in the sand on the front end is not wanting this to happen before Easter. So Easter Monday would be the earliest. On the back end has to do with expenses, which is the June 1 aim or June aim has to do with cost. Uh, yes. So that leads to the, to the follow-on question, which is how much, and, and what are some of the constraints there. So I just want to mention, uh, the total project cost here is $24 million. That's, that's what we're building together. Uh, and we're uh, today in the midst of a $7 million capital campaign, and, and we're halfway there. So uh, what, what we're hoping for uh, is you know, really the contingency on breaking ground is uh, the raising of capital so that we can uh, go through uh, whatever financing that Episcopal Homes needs to do, and then we can be in the ground. Third, Tony was four, three was four. Oh, right. four this is an observation. When Michael was talking about the difficulties of life at 1730, it sounded like an exact echo of what happened before this cathedral was built, when the church downtown had a broken boiler and the roof was coming in and they couldn't decide which one to fix and the only thing they could do was sell that property, which allowed us to build this place here. Um, so our history, this is a, an exact echo of that bit of early history. Thank you. That is very helpful. Yes, this has happened before. Uh, fourth question, and then fifth, and then sixth. Yeah, I, appreciate, I appreciate the information about Episcopal homes and in terms of the number of uh, buildings that are market rate as opposed to not market rate. Do we know the information as to the number of units, residential units, within the buildings? If we look at all 11 buildings of Episcopal Homes and try to calculate how many units in those 11 buildings are market rate versus not, do we have that? Yeah, it's roughly 50-50. So roughly 400 are for low income, 400 are market rate. Thank you. David. Uh, I know there was a conversation about this along the line, but as part of St. Mark's existing endowment been committed to this capital raise? No, we have not made that commitment. In fact, we 
discussed that just the other evening and is not currently on the table. It's not our intention to do that. Correct, correct. Good question. David. We as potential donors have access to pro formas for seven to 10 years out. In particular, I'm concerned about servicing a $14 million debt. I'm trying to run the numbers in my head quickly. It's even at full occupancy, just the interest expense may run about 40% of the average tenant rent a month. Is, and I have some questions in my mind about the debt servicing and the exceeded pro forma and what the, when would we be pledging collateral and when would, uh, when would the uh, bond be paid off? So Episcopal Homes is going to take the full risk for the debt. St. Mark's will have no risk for that, nor ECMN. So Episcopal Homes will bear that burden and we have, of course, been around for 120 years, so we've got a fair amount of experience with this. We feel comfortable based on the superior location, based on the connection to St. Mark's and the Bishop's Office, uh, based on the market studies we've done. We feel pretty good, uh, pretty comfortable, or we wouldn't be going down this road. Uh, we certainly would have walked away a lot sooner if we didn't feel really good about our capacity to service the debt and to, in fact, produce a bottom line that as we look ahead seven to 10 years down the road, Michael referenced already, we should be making around, uh, in terms of net cash flow, 300,000 a year split three ways, 100,000 each. The other part is yes, the, the pro formas can be available to you. Good. Um, oh, yeah. They're, they're still in, uh, so right now, part of the, uh, the conversation you're not seeing is, uh, we all have uh, our best attorneys at work putting together a legal partnership for this so that we can we can do all the things we're talking about and once that partnership is settled um, and uh, goes to our respective you know for you all the council to the trustees to to the Episcopal Homes uh, Board of Trustees uh, that's when a pro forma will be generated that makes some sense so it's, it's coming and it will be available follow up on that too uh, there are separate legal teams from each of the three entities representing their own fiduciaries working the details of this whole thing out Uh, real quick, uh, before we take the next question, folks who would still like to have a packet who don't have one yet, it would be great if we could keep handing them out now. Would you just kind of have a hand up? We've got a few extras, and we'll.